Very exciting. I promise nothing's going to mess up intentionally this week. So I'm not going to drop my Bible or anything like that. So if you miss that last week, then you'll just have to ask somebody about it later. <coughs> um, but uh, we are going to continue in the Momentum series this morning. And if you are taking notes, go ahead and write this down. Who is it really about? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Who is it really about? I think oftentimes we, we miss a few things when it comes to our lives, living them for God, and, and oftentimes we'll get things focused on ourselves and we'll begin to look to ourselves for answers, we'll begin to look to ourselves as a solution for everything, or we'll just be so focused on ourselves that we may miss God's best and what He has for us. But I know that if we're going to move forward, or if we're going to continue to move forward as individuals, as families, as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, if we're going to move forward as a church, that is going to require us to understand who it is really about and to value what God values. So if you would, bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this word. Thank you so much for this Father's Day. We honor you, our Heavenly Father, today. And we give you the praise and honor that you're worthy of because we believe you're just worth it. You're worth us putting our best foot forward. You're worth us serving you and living our lives with excellence and worshiping you with excellence. And I thank you, God, that you would just help us as we continue in this moment, in this place gathered together, that we would understand your word in such a way that it would open up Father, our minds to see things the way you would have us to see it, to alter and change our perspective, to line up with your perspective, God, to value what you value, and to understand what you would have us understand so we can correctly apply it in our lives and move forward and grow in this season of momentum, God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. There were two friends, and they were having lunch together. And the waitress brought out the customary small loaf of bread to both of these guys as an appetizer. And one of the men grabs a loaf of bread immediately, and he cuts it. But he doesn't cut it right down the middle. He cuts it to where there's three-fourths of the bread on one end, and then there's the smaller fourth. And he takes the larger piece for himself, and he gives the smaller part to his friend. And his friend looks at him and says, Buddy, you sure got some nerve. And he said, What do you mean? He said, Well, you took the big half, and you gave me the little half. And he looked at him and he said, well, how would you have done it? He said, well, if it were up to me, I would have given you the big half and I would have kept the little half. He said, well, I've got it, don't I? <laughs> See, oftentimes we become really focused on ourselves. And when we do, when we get too focused on ourselves, we lose sight of purpose. We lose sight of what God has created us for. And you know, a lot of times that we get focused on our agenda or we get just simply focused on our preference of the way that we like things or the way that we think, sh we, we think that things should be, or we get focused on our comfort level, we lose the original reason for even doing what we do. A lot of times we get so clouded by our own agenda. We get so clouded by our desire to be comfortable. And so if anything that causes us to want to move forward in life and then there's change and something happens to where it makes us a little uncomfortable or it's beyond our, our level of preference, all of a sudden we, we, we begin to get very inward focused because we want it to be something that fits within the scope of our agenda or things that we like or things that we can control. And oftentimes we get so focused on ourselves that we lose sight of the reason why we begin to do what we do in the first place. We lose our sense of purpose every time. When we get focused on ourselves, we lose the why behind what we were doing. And we get clouded and, and we get frustrated and we get distracted by our lack of ability to be able to control a situation or to be able to fit something within something that is in the scope of my preference or my agenda. And so we lose the reason why. And we see it happen all the time, all in our lives, in various degrees, in various places. We see we're losing that sense of the why, the why I originally wanted to do this in the first place, the reason why God has called me to do this, and the reason that God wants me to move forward in life. And I get distracted by all of this stuff that would want to pull at my attention. If you've got your Bible, I want you to go to 1 Kings 18. I want us to read here in 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 19. This is a story about a man named Elijah. And Elijah was a prophet of God. 
he would actually speak on behalf of God to the people. God would give him a message and he would share it to the people. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to get this very wicked people to repent and turn their hearts towards God. Because there was a king, his name was Ahab during this time, and he was a pretty wicked dude, but even more wicked than Ahab was his wife, Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked, wicked lady. She ruled by intimidation. She would threaten, she would follow up really good on her threats by letting heads roll, literally. She would go, and if you didn't do what she liked, if you didn't think the way she wanted you to think, if, she, if you didn't worship who she wanted you to worship, guess what? You're dead, no question. If you do something that upsets me, I'm going to make you pay. So Jezebel was a wicked lady, and there were a lot of people that were very deathly afraid of Jezebel. And so the people of God were actually worshiping false gods because Jezebel was ruling through her husband Ahab by intimidation. And here's Elijah, prophet of God. His job is to call everybody to repent to the Lord. So guess what? Jezebel and him don't really jive. They don't really get along very well. Matter of fact, when the prophet Elijah goes and confronts all of these wicked priests, all of these pagan priests, and they both build altars to the Lord. And Elijah said, whoever's God answers by fire on this altar, that's who is the real God. And all of these priests, all these pagan priests that worship the goddess Baal, or worship the god Baal, called down, cut themselves, cried out loud as they could for Baal to answer, but they didn't, he didn't answer. But yet... Elijah prayed to the Lord, and then all of a sudden God answered by fire. You would think, wow, Elijah has such great purpose. Elijah has seen this great victory. He saw all of these, all these prophets of Baal put to death by the sword. He saw there was a cleansing in the land, and, and, and he saw that there's now opportunity for the people to return to God because they saw the fire consume the altar. Even after he had had his servants pour water on the sacrifice, the fire still consumed all of the water consumed the altar, consumed everything. And the people said, well, the Lord, he is God. Wow, Elijah is on the top of his game. Elijah is seeing the hand of God move in a mighty way. And you would think, wow, he would think God is so big and bad and God has his back that he's not scared of anything. Wrong. He's scared of Jezebel. Let's look here in 1 Kings 19. It says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Uh Uh-oh. Also, how he had executed all the prophets, all those false prophets, the prophets of Baal with a sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. Oh, snap. (laughs) And she's getting after him, and she is saying, I'm sending a messenger to let you know your time is drawing near, buddy, because this time I'm going to have your head. I'm going to have you dead, just like those prophets. And so here's Elijah. He just heard this word. But yet you think about it. Think about this. He just saw God answer by fire. I mean, all he did was praise how God just consumed this altar. Wow, God's brought this great victory in the hearts of the people returning to God. Oh, he is God. And now Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, boy. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. He didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. He ran for his life, went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. He didn't even take his servant with him. Shoot, you stay here, son. I'm gone. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat under a broom tree. He prayed that he might die. He said, it's enough. This pressure, this fear, this is too much. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Then as he lay and he slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him. And he said to him, arise and eat. He looked And over there by where his head was, was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he laid down again. He thought, okay, maybe this is like my last meal or something. (laughs) He laid down and he ate and he drank. And then the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat. The journey is too great for you. So he arose, he ate and drank again. And he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights off of one meal. Man, he went as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And when he went into a cave, he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So here the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. What are you doing, man? 
I gave you this food. You went on the strength of that food for 40 days. So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And now they seek to take my life. I'm the only one you got, God. That's it. It's just me. And now everybody is wanting to kill me. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a mantle. And he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Again, he asks him. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Maybe you didn't hear me the first time. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And now they're trying to kill me. They're seeking to take my life. And the Lord said to him, go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mel- Mahola, uh, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it will be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I've reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, listen here. Here's Elijah. Get this. He's at the point to where he's saying, just kill me. Just kill me. I- I'm done. I'm done. I'm tired of the pressure. I'm tired of dealing with this fear. Now this lady's wanting to kill me. Here I am doing all these things for you, God. They're good things. I feel like I'm making progress. I feel like I'm accomplishing my purpose. And then all of a sudden, something shifts. Something changed. All of a sudden, Elijah began to get very focused on himself. And he got so focused on himself that he got in this pity party where he just wanted to die because he was the only one that God had left. You know, God, I'm really the only true prophet left. God said, nah, no, you ain't. He said, there's 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Bell. He said, you're not the only guy. You're not the only one. You need to wake up and recognize. He said, As a matter of fact, God didn't say, oh, poor Elijah, come here, let me hold you. He didn't say that. Matter of fact, what did God do? Before God brought comfort to Elijah, God reminded Elijah of his purpose. He said, Elijah, okay, listen, I, I heard what you said. Look at this in verse, in, in verse 14. You see, I've been very zealous for the Lord. He gives his spiel. And he says, your coven- you know, they've, they've forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. I'm alone and left, and they seek to take my life. And God doesn't go, come here, Elijah. Let's, let's, let's just have some hug. Let's hug it out. Let's hug it out. It's not what he said. No. Then the Lord said, okay, I just heard you. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. <laughs> That's not very comforting, God. You see, God is reminding Elijah of his purpose. He's saying, listen, you need to get the focus off of you and back on your purpose. Because it's not about you. Because actually, give you a little wake-up call, Elijah. I've got 7,000 guys that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And I need you to wake up and realize this is not all about you. This is not about you. This is about getting those people to repent and turn back. And it's about you being obedient and trusting in me that I've got your back. The same God that consumed the altar with fire is the same God who can deliver you out of the hand of Jezebel. I'm that big and I'm that bad and I'm that strong. You know, it's kind of like when you're a kid, you know, say my daddy can beat up your daddy. Because you believe your daddy's the strongest. You believe that You believe that your daddy can whoop anybody. My daddy can beat up your daddy. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-huh, uh-uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. God's saying, listen, I can take care of Jezebel. Just like I took care of the other situation that you had to deal with. Just like I took care of the other situation. I'm still that same guy. Still that same God. It's not about you, Elijah. You didn't do this. This is me leading you. This is me guiding you. This is me directing you. And you need to trust in me. But Elijah, before... God spoke that to him. What did he do? Elijah isolated himself. He ran away from everything. He, he, he ran away and he just wanted to die. He was all alone. And listen to me. Isolation will always separate you from purpose. Isolation will always separate you from your purpose because you begin to get very inward focused. And the enemy knows that if he can get you feeling isolated, then you're going to be trapped. 
And if he can get you trapped, then he knows there's going to be no progress, no momentum in your life because he's making you believe in the lie that it's all about you and you begin to feel very isolated. You get stuck. Momentum is slowed. Momentum is stopped because now all of a sudden it's, oh, I'm focused on myself. You see, people become very isolated even in their thinking because they think they're right all the time and everyone else is wrong. Just keep looking this way, people. Just keep looking this way. Don't look to the right or the left. You know those people. I mean, they don't, they don't go to church here. Those people think they're right all the time, right? I mean, they think they're right all the time. Everybody else is wrong. Heck, every one of us think that way at some point in our life. We think that, hey, we've got all the answers. We think we're right. Everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is our problem. We become very isolated. Why? Because we're very focused on ourselves. Or we become isolated because we live in a land of self-pity. Because no one understands and everyone and everything is against me. Isolation is a trap to keep you focused on yourself. And when you focus on yourself, you'll lose your sense of purpose. The enemy will begin to feed you a bunch of junk like this that sometimes we have a tendency to believe. You know, you're the only one that's dealing with what you're dealing with. You're the only one that's going through what you're going through. You're the only one who has that issue. Oh, think of how terrible a person you are. Oh, nobody is as messed up as you are. Oh, you've got issues. Everybody in this room got issues. <laughs> to some degree or another. And yes, some of our life experiences have been different. And some of our decisions that we have made and even things that are beyond the realm of our control have been very different. And it shaped our view of one another. It shaped how we interact. It shaped our view of God. But regardless of the fact the enemy wants to take all of those situations and make you feel like you're the only one. You know, I do a lot of counseling as a pastor. And I talked to Pastor Mike about this one time when we were discussing doing marriage counseling. And I told him, I said, you know, Pastor Mike, I said, I feel like when I go into a situation where I'm doing marriage counseling, a lot of times I end up saying the same thing. Because everybody feels like their situation is just so unique that it's never been this bad before. And everybody thinks that their situation is just absolutely the worst. But what they don't realize is that there's a lot of other people going through the same stuff. Isn't that right? We find that all the time. That we go, you know what? There's a lot of people that are dealing with these same type of issues, these same type of, 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 of division, the same type of frustration. And sometimes the very root of it is even the same. But the enemy wants you to feel like you're a freak. He wants you to feel like your situation, there's no hope. He wants you to feel like there's no way you're going to make it out of this because you're the only one who's having to deal with the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the, all of the junk that you're dealing with. Nobody else has to feel that. And oh, aren't you just being just absolutely overwhelmed and destroyed? Listen, folks, there's a lot of people going through a lot of things. There's a lot of people who have went through a lot of things. And there's a lot of people who have come out on the other side because God led them and directed them. So do not lose hope. Amen? Don't lose hope. Don't say it's over for me. I'm going to throw in the towel because nobody understands. God understands. And I guarantee you, as bad as it is, that there's someone who has made it through or maybe even made it through worse and has come out on the other side. So do not lose hope because God is faithful. It's trusting in God and not getting focused on myself because when I get focused on myself, I get stuck. I get stuck and I quit moving forward and I, and I have a better tendency to want to throw my hands up in the air and go, oh, well, because I feel isolated. And then God comes and taps me on the shoulder. And what does he do? Does he say, oh, 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 you know, it's going to be okay. No, he says, let me remind you of your purpose and get you back on your path. Let me, let me remind you, you need to trust me in this situation and get back on your path. Get back up on your feet, Elijah, and go and do what I've called you to do. Be that man that I've created you to be. Be that woman I've created you to be. Push through these feelings of isolation push through the lies push through the junk that would want to stop you because the enemy is interested in you when you start moving forward because he does not want to see progress in your life he wants you to feel isolated alone and like you are just carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders and there's nothing anyone can do about it and folks that's a lie i said that's a lie it's a lie that wants us to focus on ourselves. And we lose our sense of purpose when we do that. Because momentum comes from trusting God. That's where it comes from. Momentum comes from trusting in God. Because God sees the big picture. 
God sees every small detail. He knows all of the behind the scenes work that's going on that you don't even know about. You don't even have a clue. But God does. He knows. So guess what? That means I need to trust Him, right? I said, I need to trust Him. Oh, come on, y'all in church today. He sees all the behind the scenes stuff. You know, He's not asking you to figure out a solution to your problems or to anybody else's problems that you're trying to get all up in somebody else's drama. He's asking you to trust in him and trust in his word. He's asking you to believe that he is who he says he is and that the principles and the truth that's in his word are relevant for your life today. It's not just some book that we've heard uh, read to us and taught to us that's dead and that's irrelevant, but it's very much alive. The Bible says the word is living and powerful. Amen? Amen. It's his word that causes change in us. It's his truth that influences our hearts and our lives and our thinking. He only asks for your obedience and your trust. But he's not going to get your obedience unless he has your trust. Because you, you, you've got to trust him. That he is who he says he is. And that you are not alone in the situation that you're going through. That he is there and he wants to help you through it. He wants you to grow. He wants you to become stronger in your trust in Him, and He has not left you or forsaken you. It is not over for you. Everything may not happen or work out exactly like you want it to work out or exactly when you want it to happen, but let me tell you something. You can trust God regardless of what other people say or do. That's where your hope is. Without Him, there's no hope. Without him, there's no hope, and I never stop needing him because he is hope manifest in my life. Elijah was not brought comfort until he was reminded of his purpose. You see, then he was comforted. Then he was reassured. Then all of a sudden, God said, listen, I've got 7,000 other guys. Don't worry, Elijah. You're not alone. God didn't say that at the front. He could have said that at the front of this deal and and immediately comforted Elijah because Elijah thought he was all alone. But no, before God says there's 7,000 that I have actually have that haven't bowed their knee to Baal, he says, now get up and go. Get back on track. Get back on your purpose. Get back on point. Pick yourself up, even when it's tough, even when it stinks, even when it's difficult. Pick yourself up. And by the way, I've got 7,000 others, so you're not alone. Isn't that awesome? That God comforted him, but before he brought comfort, he reminded him of his purpose. You even look at the angel. The angel would give instruction. He would say, hey, wake up, arise. It's time to go, Elijah. By the way, I got some food over here. It's like some super food. It's going to last 40 days. Awesome. It's going to be delicious. It's going to be like Willy Wonka, the gum that has all the different meals in it. You remember that? Man, that was a creepy movie. All right. You know, when we focus on ourselves, a lot of times we're looking and we're seeing, okay, (laughs) we either look in the mirror and we see what we like and we go, oh man, shoot, Mm." (laughs) hmm, and we either look and see what we like or we do this, we'll look and we go, ooh. Ooh, and we see what we don't like. But yet the problem is, is whether we're looking in the mirror and we see what we like or we see what we don't like, we see all of our failures, we see all of our mistakes, we see all of our past, see all of our flaws. If we look in the mirror and we focus on that, whether in that aspect or in the aspect of we think we're so great, when it comes to moving forward, when it comes to momentum in our lives, if I stay focused on this, then guess what? I can't see. I can't see where I'm going. Because I'm focused on me, and I'm going to trip, and I'm going to fall. Because I'm focused on myself instead of focusing on God and where He wants me to go. You remember the story of Peter. Whenever Jesus came out on to uh, Jesus came out onto the, the the lake where they were at on the sea, and there was a great storm, and He said, "Peter, come out and walk on this water." Peter had never walked on water before. He gets out and he steps and he goes, oh man, this is crazy. But he was focused on Jesus and the moment he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to put his eyes on everything else, he begins to look at the problem, he begins to look at the storm, then he began to sink. Why? Because he was looking at himself and he was going, I can't walk on water. 
So he began to focus on himself. And when he did, he began to sink. And it's the same thing in our lives. We look and we're, 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 we're wanting to move forward and we're wanting to move with momentum. We're wanting to move past the situation that we're in. We're wanting to grow. We're wanting to get stronger. We're wanting to overcome that addiction. Or we're wanting to find peace in the situation where there seems to be this huge storm. But when we get focused on ourselves, we can't see where to go. And we start tripping up all over our feet because we're too busy focused on ourselves and we're not focused on Jesus. And he said, I want you to trust me. I want you to focus on me. That's where momentum comes from. Momentum comes from trusting in God. Moving forward comes from trusting in God and realizing who it's really all about. Realizing that it's not about me, but God, it is about you and what you have for my life. You see, that'll stop momentum in our lives when I start focusing on myself and I lose, lose purpose. I need to be reminded of purpose. Let me show you this in Scripture. Go to John, the 21st chapter. The book of John and the 21st chapter. We'll read in verse 15. This is, this is after Jesus has already died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb and then he rose from the dead and then he's meeting with his disciples and he cooks some breakfast. And they're all eating breakfast together. And then check this out, John 21, 15. So when they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Simon, always the one that would want to be very zealous for God, he immediately perks up, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus looks at him and he says, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He goes, what? Maybe you didn't hear me. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I don't know, maybe you got some dirt in your ears from being in the grave. I don't know what's going on, but let me say it a little louder. I, I don't understand. Why? Yes, I, I've already answered you. He says, well, then tend to my sheep. What? Then he says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now Peter's getting grieved in his heart. He's going, man, am I not answering right? I don't, I, I don't know. He's, he looks at me and says, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know all things. And you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself. You walked where you wished. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. And another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. He said, listen, I'm reminding you of purpose, and this is going to take you all the way to you being crucified upside down on the cross. Your hands are going to be stretched, and you're going to be taken where you don't want to go, but still I'm asking you to follow me, and I want to know if you really love me right now. I want to know if you're willing to tend to my sheep. I'm wanting to know if you're willing to feed my lambs. I want to know if you're willing to feed my sheep. I want to know because that's going to be your love towards me is when you care for someone other than yourself. And he was saying, listen, Peter, it's not about you. Matter of fact, this is going to cause your life to end. This is actually going to be something that's going to be challenging to you at times because you're, want, you're going to want to be very much like Elijah where people are wanting to persecute you, kill you. But I'm asking you, if you love me, here's what I'm asking as a sign of that love. That out of your heart, out of your love for me, that you would do this. That you would be willing to follow me. You see, we can get so focused on ourselves that we can become fooled and distracted to living our lives selfishly. But purpose is reignited when we selflessly serve others. When we selflessly take the mirror off of us and we serve others selflessly. That's when purpose is reignited. That's when purpose begins to be sparked because all of a sudden now it's not about me. That's what happened with Elijah. God said, here's your purpose. Wake up, Elijah. And that's what Jesus was saying to Peter. He was saying, here's your purpose. And that purpose is reignited or or, or kindled, maybe even for the first time, when we learn to selflessly serve others. You know, neglecting to invest and to serve and to give and to love on others will actually rob the next generation of their inheritance. Because think about an inheritance for a minute. If there's going to be an inheritance... In this natural lifetime, if you're going to leave an inheritance to your children, then you're going to have to invest, right? That's how it works. 
You're, there's, there's not going to be an inheritance just because. You're going to have to invest. But you're not going to invest unless there's an interest. Because you want to be interested before you invest. I've got to want to invest. There's got to be something in my heart that says, yes, I want to invest. So for there to be an investment, there has to be an interest. If there's not an interest, if there's not a concern, if there's not a care for anyone other than ourselves, then there's not going to be an inheritance because we took something that was never intended to be about us and we made it very much about us and we got focused on ourselves while all the meanwhile, there's no inheritance left for the next generation. No one understands that love of God because we were so focused on ourselves, on our preference, on our ideas, on what we wanted, on our control, on our issues, on our agenda. And we never begin to love outside of ourselves. We never begin to serve selflessly. And therefore, we're stuck. We become very, feeling very isolated on this island of me. It's all about what I want, what I can get out of life. And we make it very much about ourselves. But purpose, folks, is reignited when we begin to selflessly serve others. For there to be an inheritance, there has to be an investment. For there to be an investment, there has to be an interest. So let me ask you today, will there be an interest in things in our lives that we really need to understand that are important? As parents, since Father's Day, let me ask you, Dad, what are you investing in? You're investing in what you're interested in. What are you interested in? Is it something that's really important? Is it something that matters? Is it something that is going to make an impact, that's going to continue, that's going to leave an inheritance? Or is it just me focused on myself? Is it just me isolating myself from my family, from my children? Mom, same question. Children, same question. Let me ask you, what are we investing in? We're going to invest where we're interested because that comes from our heart. I'm interested because this is a part of my heart and I'm willing to invest. And here is Jesus saying, Peter, do you love me? Then if you love me, then you recognize it's not all about you. You recognize there's a purpose greater than just you. Elijah, you recognize there's a purpose greater than you. Tend my sheep. Get back up. Go, go, go forward. Move forward with the momentum that I've called you to. <coughs> Serve others selflessly. Go and give your life. Go and do what I've created you to do. And stop focusing on yourself. Because momentum grows when we continually focus on what is truly important. That's when it grows. That's when it picks up. When we focus on what is continually important. What is, what is truly important in our lives, in our family, in our jobs, in our relationships, and in our church. When we focus on what God has called us to do. Loving Him loving people, and serving the world, when we focus on what really matters, then we begin to understand what is really important. Momentum begins to build. Momentum begins to help us to move forward as a church, as married couples, as single people, as children, as mothers and fathers, as employers, as employees, when we begin to focus and understand what truly is important. And here's Jesus laying it out for Peter, saying, let me show you what's really important. If you love me, then you're going to tend to my sheep. You're going to feed my lambs. You're going to take care of others and not just focus on yourself. That's what's truly important. Because you know that God loves you and that you are actually the focus of His love. Amen? That's what He has called us to do. I want to read you one more scripture before we are dismissed this morning. Romans chapter 12. Very familiar passage, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, to your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, presenting our lives to God as we're showing His love to others, we're showing what He values we're showing what he says is important to show others that love of God, to show them how we've known it to come and change our lives. What it does is it ignites purpose in us and it causes us to focus on others and not simply what we can get out of the deal or not simply get stuck and isolated in where I'm at in life, but yet I'm focusing on others and it ignites purpose in me and it causes momentum. It causes me to move forward. It causes me to grow because I'm valuing what God values. The Bible says here that by His great mercy, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice. In other words, we receive His mercy 
towards us because mercy is important to God. Why? Why is mercy important to God? Why is showing mercy important to God? Because people are important to God. Because people matter to God. And he says, you know what? You matter so much to me that I don't care how bad you've goofed up. I don't care how bad you've messed up. I've got mercy that can cover that. Matter of fact, my mercies are new every morning. I've got mercy for you because I want you to grow. Because I want to see change in your life. I want to see you walk in the victory that I've already paid for. I want you to be that man or that woman that I've created you to be. I want you to get back on point of purpose and I want you to do what I've called you to do. But to do that, you've got to get the focus off of you and you've got to start valuing what God values. I've got mercy plenty for you. So listen, when we show love and mercy to other people, what we're showing them is the same thing we get when we receive mercy from God. We're showing others that they matter to God because they matter to us. And that creates momentum in our lives. Why? Because we're connected to purpose. We're connected to something that's bigger than you and me. We're connected to something that is bigger than just looking in that mirror. And saying, oh, woe is me, or oh, how great I am. It's not how great I am, it's how great he is. It's about me focusing on him. And trusting in Him during the good times, during the bad times. Trusting in Him regardless of what other people may say or do. Because I know that He has something for me. That He has created me on purpose, for a purpose. That I'm not happenstance. I'm not a mistake. The Bible says He knew me before He even formed me in my mother's womb. And so because of that, He already knew the thoughts and plans and desires that He had for me. It's just my decision. Am I going to hook up with you, God, and trust in you and walk with you? Or am I going to stay focused on myself? Because if I, feel, if I stay focused on myself, I'm going to get isolated, feel like I'm the only one. And God says, no, you're not. You need to get back on purpose. You need to get back on point. And I want momentum to move in your life. Christianity is not what I can get out of the deal. Christianity is not the spice of life. You know, we live this life and then we just kind of, you know, add on, you know, a little, a little upgrade and we call it Christianity. That's not what that's all about. You know that? A lot of people view Christianity as an upgrade of life. They view following Christ as the spice of life or the dessert. Cherry on top. Christian. <laughs> following Christ is not an enhancement to life. Apart from following Christ, there is no life. Following Christ is life. He's not the side dish. He's the whole thing. He's everything Apart from him, there is no purpose, and I'm just spinning around aimlessly to see what I can get out of the deal. And I'm so focused on my stuff that I lose sight of anything that really matters or that's important. But with Christ in my life, all of a sudden now I have a reason for living. It's this purpose that he's given me. Not to serve myself, but I've been sent here on mission, on point for God, to do something with the time that he's given me to accomplish something that he's created me to do. Feed my sheep. Feed my lamb. Because if you love me, you're going to love others. That's how it works. We love God and it causes us to love people. Amen? Amen. Out of our love for people, it causes us to do what? To serve. To give. That's what it causes us to do. It causes us to be willing to inconvenience ourselves because we recognize I'm not staring in the mirror. Even when I'm in a time where I may be challenged to want to stare in the mirror. That's when it gets tough. Is when I would want to go, oh, <laughs> we get stuck looking in the mirror of woe. We get stuck looking at all of our things that are going on when God's saying, pick yourself up. Pick yourself up. Come on, it's time to take a step. Even when it hurts. Even when you're afraid. Even when Jezebel is on your heels. Even when everything else would try to intimidate you, would want to kill you, would want to see you fail, would want to see you destroyed. This isn't going to destroy me. That's what you need to, that's what you need to say. Somebody in this place today, I believe you're going through something right now. And you need to hear this word that what you're going through right now is not going to destroy you. It's not the end for you. You're actually going to grow past and through what you're in right now. It's not going to destroy you. And you need to maybe even say that just so you can have a bigger understanding where I'm going through right now, it's not going to destroy me. This is not the end for me. This is not over for me. I still have a purpose. It's not about me focusing on myself. It's about me focusing on purpose and building momentum in my life and growing and doing what God has called me to do. And so pick yourself up today. 
Pick yourself up today. Let this word just help you to straighten your shoulders and to square your shoulders up as you walk forward with your head held high, knowing that God is for you, not against you, that greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world, that no weapon that is formed against me to destroy me is going to prosper, that I am one with Christ, and he's already given me the victory, that I can understand that he who the Son sets free is free indeed, and I'm walking in freedom because of what Christ did, not because of what I did, that I understand his mercy is new for me every morning, that I understand that I'm more than a conqueror through the one who lives in me. And then I pick myself up and I recognize I need to get back on purpose. I need to get some of this word in me. I need to get some of this passion reignited in my heart because I've been focused on myself and I need to focus on others and focus on what God has called me to do and that's to love Him and love others and to serve. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to move forward with the momentum that is created in my heart, this passion that God is stirring up in my heart. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Here's the deal. Christianity is not about what you can get. And guess what? Neither is church. (laughs) Church is not just a bless me club. It's not about what I can get. Here's what it's about. It's about connecting to a purpose that's bigger than ourselves. Something that's causing momentum in our lives. To see lives change as we're loving God, loving people, and serving the world. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to challenge you this week. Yay, challenge. I'm going to challenge you this week. And here's what I want you to do. We're going to call this week Get Uncomfortable Week. I want us to get uncomfortable. Do something this week for someone that's outside of comfortable. Maybe someone you know, maybe someone you don't. doesn't really matter. And they can be someone that, you know, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe your boss, your coworker, your friend, maybe even a random stranger. Do something this week. I want you, maybe as an individual or as a family... I had a family over to the house uh, on a Wednesday uh, this past week, and we talked about some of the things that they've done as a family that just bless random people. They call them random acts of kindness that they do. And they're teaching their kids this, and they're modeling this in front of their kids. I just think that's just the coolest thing. Doing random things, not expecting anything in return, not getting swole up if someone doesn't say, oh, thank you, that's so wonderful. Sometimes we do something for somebody, and they don't say thank you, and we'd be like, mm, they didn't even say thank you. We'll see if I'm going to do that again. Mm-mm. That ain't right. We do what we do because of the love of God in our heart causes us to love other people. That's why we do it, not because of what we get, right? And so I want you to serve this week. I want you to do something for someone. Mow a yard. Pastor's yard's a little high. (laughs) I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. I'm joking. My yard's a little high, though. Um, 1609 Crane Court Falls. All right. Um, (laughs) I'm joking. Um, yeah. that's wrong it took like this real sweet special moment and just ruined it way to go Derek <laughs> pay, pay for an unsuspecting person's meal or their groceries maybe you're in line you see somebody you know sitting there counting their pennies I got it what? no you don't have to do it no I got it yeah that's uncomfortable man not everybody's comfortable doing it some people are they're just aggressive personalities that are cool with that some people are not they're like yeah, I don't know I don't know I don't know jump out there and do it Jump out there and do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just just do it this week. I mean, just go out there and just do something. Just go. Instead of just going back and forth and kind of teetering on that line of, should I do it, should I not? Just jump out there and do it. Just uh, just like my basketball coach used to say, just suck it up and do it. You've got 10 more burpees in you. You can do more push-ups. Come on, just suck it up and do it. You can do it. Just push through it. Push through the uncomfortable feeling, the fear. And get reignited and reconnected to purpose by serving someone else other than ourselves. Because here's the thing. When we realize this purpose of sharing the love of God, it ignites purpose in us that builds momentum. That purpose builds momentum and it helps us to continue to move forward. And that's what God's called us to do. It's not about us. It's about Him. Amen? Would you bow your heads this morning? Maybe you're here in this place today and you say, Pastor Derek, I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to make Him the leader of my life. I'm not going to embarrass you or ask you to come up or anything like that. But this is something between you and God. 
But I do want you to take this step and let me know that you're there. Let me know that you're ready to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm ready to commit my life to follow him by just doing this simple thing. Just lift your hand and put it back down, and then we're going to say a prayer together in a moment. I see your hands. Thank you, God. Anybody else in this place today? Thank you, God. You just acknowledge that need for Jesus Christ. So church, would you just say this prayer with me and help me pray with the one that lifted their hand today? And when you say this prayer, I want you to mean it from the very bottom of your heart. Because the Bible said that we first must believe in our heart, and then we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is our Lord, that we believe that he died on the cross for us. We believe that he made us right with God. So say this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you, that what you did on the cross was good enough to make me right with God to forgive me of my sins and to make me whole. So I thank you for forgiving me. Lead my life. Direct my steps. I put my faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, can we...